All right, welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar that will share findings from our new report. Yes, in my backyard, a home composting guide for local government. I'm Brenda Platt. I'm a co-author of the report and co-director at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. In addition to facilitating today's webinar, I'll present an overview of the report and then we'll hear from three of the 11 community programs that we profiled uh, in the guide. Ron Newman from Austin Resource Recovery in Texas, Carl Grimm, a senior solid waste planner with Oregon Metro in Portland, and Ian Jurgensen, the sustainability project manager for Greenworks in Orlando. This uh, webinar is being recorded. I wanna just do a shout out to Nick, um, who's our technical person, and uh, he'll be advancing all our slides. So if you hear Nick next, you'll know why. And also to my colleague, Virginia Streeter, um, who will be kind of a backup facilitator timekeeper since I'm also presenting. And also a um, real shout out to my co-author, Colton Fagundis, um, on this report, um, who was an intern with us for more than a year. And many, many thanks to all the communities who we profiled and had many follow-up questions. So uh, without further ado, let's, let's dive in. So next slide, Nick. Um, all together, today's webinar is gonna share highlights of government's supported home composting programs, along with tips for replication and lessons learned. We produced this guide in order to expand home composting. We think it's a vital residential food waste diversion strategy, and we really wanted to capture the wide range of local government initiatives that are possible. So um, we highlight, for instance, the important of importance of training and educational programs, of providing compost bins at discounted or free prices. Um, one thing that the guide does not do, and I really want to emphasize this um, up front, and the guide nor today's webinar, is it does, they do not cover how to compost at home. Um, we have resources for that. Uh, it, neither does the guide nor the webinar address how to reduce food waste at the source or rescue edible food, both of which are priorities over composting, but rather our focus is really on key considerations for local government in starting a city or county run home composting program. Now, before we start the presentations, we have a few polling questions uh, to get a sense of who's participating today and a snapshot of uh, where you are regarding composting, uh, yard debris, as well as food scraps. So Nick, if we could do the polling. All right, so where are you um, in the country? And if you're outside the US, there's an option for you there too. So we have, oh, you guys are quick, 65, 70% voted, a few more seconds, see if we can get closer to 100%. All right, Nick, and the results are? Um, all right, most are in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. Ah, oh, but we have 8% outside the US. And as of right now, by the way, we have 83 participants in the, in the polling. Okay, next question. Where, uh, what sector are you from? State government, local, regional, are you a consultant? Are you community scale composting? The other could be individuals, universities, manufacturers, et cetera. All right, and the results are, okay. Local regional government, most of you are. Good, we're reaching our target audience, I think. Thank you. Next question. Do you, if you're, doesn't matter if you're with local government or not, no matter where you are, does your city and county have a home composting program? Yes, it's one that's supported by the government. Yes, we have one, but it's kind of the extension or master gardeners. Um, no, but you're interested in starting one and no program at all, you're not sure. Those are the options. A few more seconds. And the results are, 
Okay. One of one third of you already have some sort of government sponsored home composting program. Okay, I hope you will learn something today for how to expand or improve or do something different. Um, some of you already have a program, but it's not supported by the local government. We hope you'll learn that today that's really important. Um, and some of you are not sure are very interesting. Okay, and we have 90 attendees participating right now. Okay, next question. just to get a sense of whether you're already collecting yard trimmings at curbside. Sorry, we didn't do the not sure, but yes or no options. If you're not sure, don't participate. All right, and the results are, all right, two thirds, close to two thirds do. All right. Two more questions, similar to that one. Does your city county offer food scraps collection? This one's a little different because it can be in addition to curbside drop off like at farmer's market. Um, uh, but does your city offer food scraps collection in some form for composting or anaerobic digestion? Again, if you're not sure, just skip it, yes or no. All right, and the results are? More than two thirds do not. So, okay, this is this is good because home composting is an option to offer um, to get some of these food scraps diverted, and you and local government can support this. Last question, um, and this has to do with before we do the webinar, and please only pick two of these. You can select as many, but we just want to pick your top two, and we could only give five options here. So. What do you think are the most significant obstacles to expanding or starting home composting in your community? Read them all before you select the top two, please. It's a little slower to vote because you have to read these, right? <laughs> all right. Just wait for a few more votes to come in. They're still coming in. All right, let's, all right, results are, ooh, okay. Lack of training and exposure to best management practices takes the prize. Lack of, uh, lack of access to discounted or free home composting bins, second. And I will just share with you that we have people who are trying to join the webinar who can't right now because we are full. So um, uh, that's a good sign. We had overwhelming interest in this webinar. All right, so that's the last polling. Um, and uh, let us now um, dive into um, uh, next slide. I just wanna uh, share a word or two about the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Um, and uh, we are a 44-year-old nonprofit, national nonprofit. We promote healthy communities, essentially through local economic development. We have offices in DC, Minneapolis, and Portland, Maine. We work in pivotal sectors, such as energy, waste, broadband, and retail. Um, strengthening local economies and building community equity have been part of our mission since we were founded in 1974. Please check out our programs and resources. Our Community Scaled Economy Initiative just exactly a week ago, released a report on Amazon's control of city purchasing. And today, our Energy Democracy Initiative is releasing a report, Reverse Power Flow, which outlines the transition from the dying utility distribution monopoly to a vibrant democratic energy system where customers have the opportunity to choose distributed energy options um, that benefit themselves in the greater grid. And I think you'll see some uh, threads uh, to our work in, in community composting. Next uh, slide shows some of our uh, resources that we produce through our Composting for Community initiative, which I head up. And like our other initiatives, we provide a vision of the opportunities, we provide tools, we offer a menu of policies to achieve that vision. We've written a lot of reports, um, but we are really specifically inter interested in catalyzing a distributed food waste composting. Uh, options, not only home composting, but community and on-farm as well, in addition to larger scale facilities that may be needed. And uh, this report 
Yes in My Backyard is part of our ongoing work to document working models and share tips for replication. As our uh, and the next slide shows our resources include infographics and posters like this one. Uh, we also have videos and we have a new podcast series series called Composting for Community. Please check it out. Um, we all also offer compost training through our Neighborhood Soil uh, Rebuilders Composter Training Program, uh, which is shown on the next slide. And um, we are available to help uh, uh, also customize this training for home composting. Um, so next slide shows that one of the that for composting there's lots of ways to do it. One beauty of composting is that it can be small scale, large scale, and everything in between. Backyards, community gardens, schools, retreat centers, farmers can all compost on site. Um, so where does home composting fit in? Uh, the next slide shows our new hierarchy to reduce food waste that we've developed. It's available also in Spanish and uh, some other languages um, and in various poster formats. But in addition to prioritizing preventing food waste in the first place and rescuing edible food to feed people, um, it then promotes locally based and small scale systems before centralized systems. So the third bar there is home composting. So we think looking at it through the lens of keeping these materials in your community is should be prioritized over collecting and taking to faraway sites, or at least before. So um, the next slide just kind of shows for the report we did, yes, in my backyard, um, if you um, uh, how the report is organized. If you haven't already, please check out the guide um, online. It's 90 pages. The report itself is divided into these five parts. About 40 pages are the case studies alone of the 11, pro 11 programs, and each case study presents a summary. And when available, when we have the information, we have information on the budget, the staffing, the partners, the impacts, the benefits and costs, um, the marketing and outreach, training and education, tips for replication, and many links to more information. Um, we also pulled together appendices, um, which are available on our website, as well as produce these standalone 10 steps for a successful program, um, and another piece called T Key Takeaways and Recommendations. So lots of resources, and we can't even begin to cover all of these uh, today. So please look at those. So what I'm going to do, um, beginning on the next slide, is kind of go through our key findings in the next few minutes, starting with why offer a program in the first place. And clearly, there are many reasons. Here are 10. Um, one thing, um, and I just quickly to run through this, is really all so important and somewhat interrelated. But you can begin a home composting program faster than building a large scale industrial site or providing bins to every household to collect food scraps and yard waste. To do home composting, you don't actually need to have a commercial facility in your region, although we do want more infrastructure. And you often hear that the biggest obstacle to uh, composting food scraps or recovering them is lack of capacity. So no obstacle there. Um, we keep the material circulating within our neighborhoods and residential soils. Uh, four is really you're building this culture of composting know-how. And I think when you do roll out a municipal or county program, you're going to have people who know about contamination, who understand the value of composting. Young composters become old composters. So ingraining this knowledge in the next generation cannot be understated. Number five, diversion. Um, I think uh, it's been very... Uh, one, I, I'll just say one misconception I think about home composting is that it can only divert a small portion of residential waste, and we completely disagree with that idea. Studies indicate that 23 to 83 pounds per household per month could be diverted through home composting, and that when you offer personalized training and support, you can increase that potential. So diversion. It's cost effective without requiring these really intensive municipal services. And the main reason for that is you're cutting collection and material processing costs for local government while providing residents with a 
free soil amendment to those who are home composting. Um, so you're avoiding all that labor and cost and tipping fees, whether it's for the landfill or incinerating or incinerator or the commercial composting site. The other thing about those cost savings is that as long as households keep co co composting, they're cumulative. Um, if you are looking at starting a curbside collection program, it's uh, not mutually exclusive. Um, and then the other point is this contributes to a distributed and diverse infrastructure, which we think is healthy. All right, next slide. So we, uh, one of our findings, like we crunched some numbers on the potential diversion just to come up with um, some rules of thumb that you might be able to use in your own community. And we found that for every 10,000 households home composting, an estimated 1,400 tons per year could be diverted from disposal and using national average tip fees for landfills of just under $52 a ton, that would result in $72,000 per year in disposal fees avoided. Now, if you're, and that's with the conservative poundage, more like the 23 pounds per month per household. If it's you're doing personalized hands-on training and support with subsidized bins, then you can divert closer to 5,000 tons per year for every 10,000 households. And there, depending on your avoided disposal fees, if it's along the lines of the national average, that's coming to be more like a quarter uh, million dollars. Now, um, one of the articles that uh, BioCycle covered back in 2011, the value and benefits of backyard composting, I have a screenshot of that here, was the uh, North Shore Recycling Program, which uh, was was the former uh, tri uh, municipality agency serving the wider city of North Vancouver uh, in 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 Canada? And over a five-year period, they invested approximately sixteen thousand in bin subsidies, but backyard composted resulted in avoided tip fees of $3.5 million. Um, and their also extensive study over a year showed that with the training, households would compost almost 220 pounds more each year than the unsupported households. So again, I just really want to underscore that um, backyard composting, I think, has been severely undervalued and is far more important than previously thought. And one thing I'll just make the point now is that the future of composting is being shaped right now as cities and states implement strategies to cut food waste. And the potential to grow home composting is largely untapped, but massive. And we think it can play a significant role in recovery, but it needs to be resourced and prioritized. All right, so the next slide shows um, the 11 profiled communities. And again, these are communities that have govern, government supported programs. Those are the ones we featured in our report. We have eight cities, two counties, one metropolitan region. This table lists those communities, their population, the year the program began, comparative data on compost bins uh, distributed. The town of Chevrolet, Maryland is the smallest with a population under 7,000. Los Angeles County is the largest with a population over 10 million. Uh, six are on the West Coast, one is in the Southwest, two in the Northeast, two in the South. Uh, I can tell you that most are in urban or suburban areas, but there's at least one program, Napa, which spans some rural areas. Um, the other thing I think that's interesting is that we tried to cover a lot of the programs that have been around for a long time, like Seattle, Oregon Metro, who we'll hear from, New York City and Vancouver in Canada. They were among some of the first home co composting programs in North America and they have distributed far more bins than the other programs that we featured. And I think their historical successes are really good examples for any of you looking to start new programs. But I will say that some of the newer programs that we looked at are more active and actually may offer best current examples of programs worth imitating. And we're gonna hear from two of these today, Austin and Orlando. So the next slide just uh, summarizes a uh, key takeaways um, and recommendations. And we kind of uh, summarized in these, these five points. It's really, you want to make home composting bins accessible to residents. You want to educate and train. You want to set them up for success. Clearly, you need to do outreach and marketing. One of the things that I think 
perhaps all communities that we even we profiled could could look at improving on is measuring, evaluating, and improving their programs. And then the last thing we spent quite a bit of time on this in uh, part four of the report is just looking at ordinances and local policies. A lot of cities have really antiquated ordinances that restrict the ability to home compost. So you really can't get started unless you're looking at if there's old laws that you have to fix. All right, so let me just go through some of these points. Um, um, on the next slide, on the bin distribution, I'll just say that local government can make bins more readily available by offering them at a discounted price through bulk purchasing contracts, a pre-order program, um, or by direct uh, subsidizing the bins. Uh, many residents don't have the knowledge or time to construct their own composting system, even if they are interested in home composting. So local government can provide info on how to build a compost bin or a compost pile. They can provide the prefabricated prefabricated commercial bins at a reduced or free price. Um, these are some of the bins uh, that are that are offered. Uh, I think one of the interesting things of the um, Seattle yard composter shown on the bottom left is um, that that's made by a local company out of recycled plastic. So supporting a, a local business is uh, one thing worth considering. Uh, also, I'll just point out um, the soil saver on the top left um, comes easier to carry. So cities that are more urban dense where people aren't coming with their vehicles to pick up a bin, offering something that they can actually carry on a bus could be something worth considering uh, if uh, need be. Um, we see a variety of stationary bins as well as uh, tumblers like the Deradul batch that's shown on the bottom right, which is off the ground. So there's no uh, one type of system. And um, I'll just say that uh, ILSR does not endorse any particular vendor or bin. Um, so really do your own research and uh, we're happy to provide advice. Uh, one thing also next slide shows is don't overlook worm bins. They're a good option for households that don't have a yard, which is why we call the uh, report home composting rather than backyard composting. And with worm bins, you can compost inside a house or apartment. And another point about these is that you don't need to secure the carbon or brown, such as leaves or wood chips, for a worm composting bin. So a number of the programs that we featured um, cover worm bins. Uh, this one is another example of a bin that's made locally uh, by Vancouver working with um, Transform Compost. And you can get the bin for $25 if you take the training uh, course on how to use it, which is shown uh, below in the picture. Okay, so um, let me just spend a few more minutes kind of uh, wrapping up here so we can get into our other presentations. So I just want to show on the next slide how important education and training is. Um, it's a central part of any Oh, the next slide actually, sorry, let me back up, is bin distribution. Actually, this is really important for you all to know is that there's many options for how you make these bins available. And depending, um, you know, if you want to start off, you can do like um, uh, a pre-order program of discounted bins where you're not really out of pocket, but residents um, can uh, order bins online and then the a vendor distributor can deliver them to a central location and residents can come pick them up. You may need to have a minimum order. Um, along the same lines as truck sale events where bins are sold at discounted prices. Um, there's a picture of people lining up in Duluth, Minnesota to get their bin at a discounted price. People are interested in this. Um, Subsidized bins for residents to buy at below market value price. Um, that's uh, Chevrolet Maryland does that. He uh, buys the um, uh, pallet loads and is able to offer bins at almost half the retail market. Um, voucher rebates, we'll hear from Austin. That's something they do. Um, and this is a screenshot of a compost bin voucher program uh, from San Diego as an example. Again, we have lots of these. And then uh, free bins is always an option. All right, next slide on... Um, and moving into education and, and training. Um, as I was saying, an essential part of any home composting program, there's many different options. Uh, one study found that the most important factor 
in determining a person's interest in using a composting bin is their confidence in their ability to produce finished composting without creating bad odors or messes. So by offering training and educating them, uh, you really are setting your, um, your residents uh, up for success. And this is just showing you um, how many are offering the in-person workshop and whether it's required to get a discounted or free bin. Uh, whether there's a master composting course, uh, demonstration sites can be important, hotlines, a number of these communities offered hotlines and of course all offer you know, online or print materials. Uh, the next slide just shows some photos of some of the training and um, San Diego's demonstration site is shown here. And I, I'll just say that at a demo site, vid visitors can learn on their own schedule. It could be a place not only for trainings and purchasing or building bins, but it can double as a demo site for other gardening skills and techniques. So uh, we think this could be important moving forward. Uh, the next few slides just show some outreach and marketing examples, and we have more. So Nick, you can just kind of go through these after a few seconds. This is, um, this is San Diego's, just some outreach on their bin voucher program and the bins that are covered. Next slide. Um, LA's just in different languages about their smart gardening workshop and the coupon. Um, the uh, San Diego, the voucher, it's available to local Dixie Line kind of hardware store. Um, and they, as because it's with Dixie Line, they get free advertising through that hardware store. So again, partnerships with local businesses is great. Next slide. Um, this is Vancouver's uh, online as well as print brochure on how to compost, it's only two pages. This is the first page, the next one shows the next page. So you really wanna um, uh, uh, show like what to compost, what you can't compost. Uh, they also do the worm bins as I shown before. So the, um, the next slide just shows the first one page of their uh, worm bin, which is a little bit different very easy. Um, the next slide shows LA's, some of their outreach materials, and this is like an 11 page document, a little more text heavy. But what I loved about it is it has like several pages of the microorganisms that are living in your compost pile. So I think this is really important. I, and I go to this a lot, LA's resources. So really look at all this stuff that we have online. Okay, next slide um, is just a, uh, Measuring, evaluating, and always in con constantly improving your program is really important. I think that'll help you, if you know poundage or tonnage, calculate your savings, cost and savings, and you can solicit some volunteers to weigh materials. The appendix we have on reports and local programs, some of those have some of those reports, so look at those. Um, and I love that we have like Seattle's measuring backyard composting, like from the 90s. Uh, so check that out. There's the website for all of our resources. And I'm just going to end with, you know, um, I was going to talk about the ordinances. Um, the next few slides just show what's really important here. And I don't really have time to go into it. So just read that section in the report on the good, the bad, and the ugly, because I think it's really important. The next slide just kind of highlights uh, one Napa's uh, kind of a decent composting ordinance that's more performance-based that uh, rather than being overly prescriptive. And I, I really think this section that we wrote up is really, really important. So I hope you'll, I really hope you'll look at it. And just some closing thoughts uh, before I hand it over to, to Rod and Austin is um, just to say, uh, next that the last slide here, uh, Nick, is, um, is really think about partnering with nonprofits to provide the training and demo sites. San Diego does that with Solano, Vancouver partners with a nonprofit called City Farmer, which also runs the um, demonstration site in, in Napa, it's with the local master gardeners. I think Ian may touch on in Orlando, it's with the University Extension Services. In New York City, it's with the um, seven nonprofit partner organizations that provide the, the, the training. The local businesses, you can be supporting local hardware stores, local manufacturers, in addition to the nonprofits. And, um, and please, please don't forget about the do-it-yourself bins because they often can actually operate better. 
and can be done, made from repurposed uh, materials. And hopefully somebody will ask me about not restricting community exchange of materials from backyards because um, I think that's going to be increasingly important to um, help expand this. So um, the last slide just, just shows that we are available, I mentioned it earlier, to adapt our training to help you. So please contact, please contact us if you're interested. And um, right now what we're going to do is we're going to move into the three communities, starting with Ron Newman with Austin Resource Recovery. He's a waste diversion planner working on the Zero Waste Program Development Team with, with Austin Resource Recovery. And um, he's also the program manager for the City of Austin's Composting Rebate Program. So Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Ron. And while he's getting set up and his presentation is being loaded, um, in your uh, uh, chat window for the webinar, please feel free to start typing uh, questions. And uh, we're going to take all the questions at the end. All right, Ron, you are up. Thanks, Brenda. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ron. I'm with Austin Resource Recovery. And just as she said, I'm a waste diversion planner and the acting program manager um, for our compost rebate program. And I'd just like to go ahead and tell you a little bit about what's going on here in Austin and our zero waste goal. Um, Nick, next slide. Next slide. Um, our zero waste goal in Austin um, is to be zero waste by 2040. Um, we did set some um, smaller goals uh, in 2010. We wanted to be at 38%, 2015, 50%. Uh, our big one is 2020 at 75%. Um, the reality for us here in Austin is that we fell short of our 2015 goal. Um, reality is we're about 42.3 or 5%. Um, so that was kind of a little bit of a shock to us. And so we uh, decided to um, get serious and kind of um, do a lot more um, innovative stuff. And so we uh, looked into research, um, we checked our programs, and we um, came up with a lot of really great stuff and that we're implementing right now. Next, uh, next slide. Um, all of our services here in Austin are bundled. Um, so we have curbside single stream recycling, that's um, bi-weekly. We have curbside compost, um, that's weekly. Our trash is, of course, weekly. We have yard trimmings that are weekly. Um, and that can be com combined with your compost. Um, we do have large brush two times a year, bulk items two times a year, street sweeping, hazardous waste, and a lot more other services. Um, okay. Um, and our costs are based on the trash cart size, and we reflect a per gallon approach. Um, so the bigger your cart, the more you're going to get charged. Um, all of our fees include a base fee of $14.05, and then you're charged per gallon from there. Um, so our largest cart at 96 gallon um, will cost you $42.85, and our smallest cart um, is 24 gallon, and um, those residents are charged $17.90. Um, so what we do is that we encourage people to recycle and compost, and if they do that, then they will save money um, on their services. Um, and included in their bill is what we call a clean community fee. Um, that's for our community services, such as litter abatement, dead animal collection, um, those other things, and it's $8.95. And that fee um, is monthly, and that's an important um, element to our program because in order to qualify for the program you must pay the clean community fee and um, not only residents but also um, or single family residents but multi-family residents can also pay this clean community fee um, next slide um, so our home composting rebate program um, just a high level overview is um, the program offers customers who pay the clean community fee and participate in a free education class um, they will receive a rebate um, on a new home, home composting system and accessories or a chicken coop. And um, people can get one $75, $75 rebate per household. Um, next slide. Um, beginning in uh, Earth Day 2010, we launched the Green 30 Challenge. Um, it's a pilot program that challenged Austin to downsize to a 30 gallon green garbage cart. Um, we've since then changed to a 32 gallon. Um, but Back then, we were using the 30-gallon. Um, they would take a free um, composting class. And then if they purchase a home composting system, they would receive the rebate, and then they would start composting. 
Um, we let that um, ride for about five years. We collected data, everything was going well. Um, and then in 2015, that's whenever we discovered um, that we were a little short on our um, zero waste goals. And so one of the things that we did was opened it up. So we removed the reduced cart requirement um, which increased potential rebates for everyone in Austin, and that also included um, multifamily residents. And um, it, we were hoping to increase the version of compostables. Um, next slide. In 2017, we um, uh, we added chickens to the program. Um, it's, it was kind of uh, groundbreaking. It was really fun. Um, we kind of did some quick chicken math, if you will. In Austin, there were there are roughly 3,000 homes um, with chickens, and we kind of averaged it out, and that yielded about 24,000 chickens um, in Austin. That's about an estimated 2 million pounds of food diversion um, by chickens, which is about um, just over 1,000 tons per year that was already occurring. And in the existing curbside composting pilot program, we had an average of 1,237 tons that were being diverted. And we figured out that in one year, chickens can convert as much as the program had in five years. So it was like a one to five ratio. And so, and why was this happening? Well, because there's more chickens, um, plain and simple. And kind of a fun fact is one household composting diverts as much as 3.3 chickens eating food scraps. Um, next slide. Um, our chicken and compost classes are held monthly um, at very, various locations um, around Austin. We go to farmer's markets, we go to libraries, local retailers, community gardens, festivals. Um, we're just about all over the city of Austin, um, and we run at least four classes every month, um, two chicken classes and two compost classes. We also offer classes by request and community-led classes. So people can call in and request a class. Um, it could be at their neighborhood. Um, it could be for their gardening group. It could be for any number of reasons. And then we also have the community-led classes where um, we would talk to them, see if they're a good um, lead for composting. And then they would take our curriculum and teach the class themselves. And that would be, again, with um, community groups, um, private groups or at their um, neighborhoods. And all of these requests are made via website or telephone. And then we also offer the composting class in an online video format. Um, we haven't started a check-in class video um, yet. Um, next slide. And so our classes are currently promoted um, using our website, uh, the Austin City events pages. We're on social media using Facebook and Nextdoor. Uh, we use the local newspaper, the Austin Chronicle, um, the local newsletter called the Eco Network, and then um, we also promote at community events. And oftentimes we pair our classes, um, meaning that we have one composting class paired with a chicken keeping class. And so that way we can um, hopefully bring in more people that have a wider variety of interests. And oftentimes people will stay for the next class because if they have an interest in one, they might have an interest in the next one. Next slide, please. Um, so the benefits to the community, um, I've kind of mapped out the program participation for you. Um, to date, we've had 14,800 people um, attend a composting or chicken keeping class. In fiscal year 17, it was um, just over 2,200 people that attended. Um, we had 1,900 on composting and uh, a little over 250 for chicken keeping. We issued 5,140 rebates. Um, in fiscal year 17, we issued uh, 538 rebates, 528 for composting, and 10 for chicken keeping. Um, our overall participation rate for the program is 34.7% of attendees. They apply for and receive a rebate. So it's not necessarily that they attended a class, it's that they actually followed through and applied for and received a rebate. Um, in fiscal year 17, our goal was 30%, and um, our actual was 28%, but that's because we had to um, combine the compost with the chickens. If we had just focused on just the compost, it was at 32%, but if we focused on the chickens, it was 4%, and so that's how we got to 28%. Um, what do people think about our classes? They love them. 96% um, of all class attendees um, rate our classes as very or extremely informative, and 94% rate our instructors as excellent or very good. Next slide, please. Um, 
the performance over half the attendees at both types of classes are under 44 years of age and then about over a quarter of attendees are 55 plus um, you can see um, the blue in the both of the um, graphs the blue is for chicken and the green is for compost and um, it's kind of interesting that most of our attendees um, for chickens, 66% are female. And again, 57% of our attendees at the compost classes are also female. Next class, please. Or next slide. Um, by the numbers, um, on the right-hand side, I've kind of broke down um, kind of our costs for instructors, equipment rentals. And what I mean by equipment rentals is that we rent tents and chairs and tables to go out to the events. Um, then we have advertising, we have our um, rebates, materials miscellaneous. Under materials miscellaneous, that would be for the composting, uh, the kitchen collectors, um, and for whatever um, swag. And then our printing and postage um, last year was a little high because we introduced the chicken um, keeping class. And so um, that kind of upped our cost a little bit. Um, so our average cost participant was $28.75 per participant. Um, but that's not normal. That's just because we introduced kind of a whole new program. Um, we uh, had 35 classes, including 24 compost and 11 chicken keeping classes. Over 80% of the participants say they plan to apply for a rebate. Um, nearly 40% of the attendees are already composting at home, and almost 20% already have chickens at home. So people are coming strictly for education. Um, we conducted 120 hours of outreach and education. Um, just over 2,000 people received that education and we handed out almost 300 kitchen compost collectors last year. Um, next slide. Um, our general performance observations in composting is that our online composting video views have increased by 15%. Um, so people are really enjoying that um, ability to learn about composting at home without having to go to a class. And um, interest also remains um, high in learning about composting. On the chicken side, um, despite significant interest in chicken keeping, only 4% apply for a rebate. Um, the in-person chicken keeping class um, attendance is very competitive. We oftentimes have standing room only, or um, people just can't um, register for a class um, because it's already full. And um, so interest remains very high in learning about chicken keeping. So what we're learning is that people are interested in the educational aspects of our program, and we really like that. Next slide, please. Um, our next steps is that we're gonna continue to research methods of increasing rebate participation. Um, mostly on the chicken side, uh, what we've figured out is that um, getting into keeping chickens it's a very time consuming, it's a very big commitment. And so it's not something that you can just go out and buy a composter and start composting. Um, so we realize people need, a, we've learned that people need a little bit more time. And so that could be one of the reasons that we have low participation, but we're gonna be doing additional research on that this summer. And so we could have a better answer for you, um, hopefully by this fall. Um, we also uh, last year rolled out curbside composting. Um, throughout the city. Um, we're doing it in four phases. And so we're not really sure of the impact of rolling out curbside composting on our home composting program. So that's something else for us to look at right now. Um, we just rolled out 35,000 um, new households uh, added to the service. So right now we have approximately half the city of Austin with um, curbside composting service. And the other half is about to go uh, come online hopefully by um, 2020. Um, and then we're also gonna be doing increased outreach to multifamily properties um, for composting classes and rebates. Um, one of the things that we did is that we changed our um, backyard composting rebate program. We changed the wording to home composting rebate um, because we want people to understand that you can compost at your home. It doesn't matter if it's single family or if it's multifamily, you do have the ability to compost. Um, next slide, please. And so that's basically it that's going on in Austin. Um, again, if you have any questions, there's my contact information and you are welcome to contact me at any at any time. Uh, thank you, Ron. Um, sure. uh, and, you know, I'm so glad you included the, the chicken coops and the fact that you have community led training. So again, I just wanna emphasize, um, there's no one way to offer this, just get on the path and, uh, and be innovative and um, 
integrate the best features of the best programs that you see. So we'll be bringing up uh, Carl Grimm's uh, presentation. And while we're doing that, let me introduce you. Uh, he is a senior planner at Oregon Metro um, in the Portland uh, area, where he works to eliminate health environmental equity impacts from products used and disposed in the greater Portland metro region. He developed and managed the San Francisco Home Composting Program in the 90s, then went on to establish the Chicago Home Composting Program in 2005. And at Metro, he's also led the natural gardening program for over a decade. So lots of experience. So Carl, um, you're on. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm so excited to share a few thoughts about uh, well, why we care about home composting. You want to advance that first slide, please? A little outline here. Um, and for me, it's it's really all about uh, eliminating waste, reversing global warming, growing an urban ecosystem, and connecting youth with nature. Uh, I'd also like to share a little bit about um, putting home composting into a, a strategic context, ways to be proactive about rodents, um, being real about budgets and bandwidth, and uh, realizing the immense and exciting opportunities we have to advance racial equity, diversity, and inclusion through our programs. Next slide, please. So on eliminating waste, um, the, uh, I'm sorry, just a sec. Yeah. So home and curbside composting um, can really help eliminate waste, as, as has been described. Um, in this webinar already, and um, in the life cycle of materials uh, from extraction to manufacture, transport, um, use, and discard, and then recovery, the more we can prevent waste before it is discarded, the better. And, and home composting um, prevents the discard of organic materials in the use phase, creating a cycle of materials that's been essentially in one's own yard and, or community. And Metro's home and cur curbside composting programs were developed in tandem in the 1990s and have thrived together, partly because we tapped into the region's love for gardening. And, and we've provided all, all along the way many different options for people um, to, to you know, essentially create gardener's gold. Um, in, in the heyday of our home composting efforts, um, we sold over a hundred thousand or almost a hundred thousand compost bins um, through all different methods, but largely largely through you know truck single day or multi day events truck sales um, by two thousand and six um, roughly half of the single family residences in our in our tri county region of a million and a half people were composting um, or grass cycling or mulching, um, doing something on site with their with their uh, food and or fruit, uh, yard trimmings at home. And um, about 10 years ago, when the city of Portland um, increased the size and the capacity um, and the frequency of yard waste collection, um, and also added food waste to the collected materials. Um, we did see uh, we did see kind of uh, the sales of of our home compost bins um, go down substantially. Um, you know, before the before the change, um, people had to pay extra for anything over 32 gallons of yard waste and the collection was only every other week. And so by making it more frequent and increasing the size, doubling the size of the bin to 60, 64 gallons essentially, um, it, it, it sort of, you know, a lot, a lot of people were like, okay, maybe I don't, you know, don't, I'm not as quite as motivated to go buy a compost bin. Um, but, but still a lot of people are composting because of the kind of gardening fervor in the region here. Um, and the work, you know, the initial work that we we did um, over the years, um, and and even now, some of the cities, there's 25 cities in our region here. Um, some of them actually provide financial incentives for home composting, and um, and we do continue to sell compost bins through our recycled paint facility, Metro Paint. We sell about 500 uh, units per year at cost, essentially. Um, so 
yeah so that's that, that's like if you could advance the slide that's that's kind of perspective on the eliminating waste side of things um now reversing global warming is a is a grand um and important uh goal and um Fortunately, aerobic composting can, particularly in food scraps, can sequester carbon and reduce methane. Both combined um, have essentially put them onto the list of 100 things that drawdown.org um, has identified as existing scalable solutions that together can reverse global warming, which is really exciting. I highly recommend checking out this, this resource, drawdown.org. Um, so of course, some additional emissions can be reduced uh, because home composting, you know, avoids the need to haul and process uh, the compostable materials. So that's a pretty exciting thing that it, it made the list, home composting or composting food scraps. Next slide, please. Um, so the other uh, thing that home compost can do is help us to grow an urban ecosystem with local food, wildlife habitat, and, and an array of different services that can be enhanced. Uh, and and um, in San Francisco, uh, back in 1990, uh, helped establish the the um, home compost pro program there, and the the sort of central meeting place was the Garden for the Environment, and so. Um, this this was a, a great um, opportunity to um, to be able to show people to showcase what we were doing, and um, and through that program we added uh, later added a community composter training, um, and that le then later uh, included urban farming training, and now to this day through GardenForTheEnvironment.org these programs are still offered. Um, so, you know, there's just this great, you know, growth in this, in, in urban farming and, and interest in growing food. And I think that's a great, uh, that's a really, you know, that's, that's a win to, to put behind your sales and, and to weave into your, your offering and messaging. Um, native plant, uh, pollinator protection, pesticide reduction, water conservation, water quality protection, backyard habitat programs are all popping up all over the place and and um and they all integrate really well with home composting. So I encourage you to look at what's out in out there in your region and nationally that you can kind of tap into and piggyback on and and um combine uh uh, resources with to to expand your reach and and deepen the ability of the home composting to address these sort of broader ecosystem goals for our urban areas. Next slide, please. So c composting can clearly connect youth with nature, and really in in a way that few other things can. Um, I have two kids under seven. That's one of them, my youngest, uh, who's uh, communing with a uh, freakishly large uh, night crawler in in our backyard garden, and um, it's it's just it's just really fantastic to see how excited kids get and how squeamish they get and how what a great opportunity that is to really, I mean, really uh, engage with nature on a, on almost a micro scale, but uh, a powerful way and. Um, Metro has uh, waste reduction and recycling education programs here in the region that make about 50,000 contacts per year with students and um, consistently the Compost City Puppet Show, uh, shown up there in the upper right, and, um, and our worm composting class presentations are among the most popular programs that our school uh, um, educators uh, offer. And um, they've worked really hard to make strong connections to our state education standards to help fuel the interests of teachers, and then they deliver engaging hands-on learning to ignite the curiosity of the students. So it's really it's really a, a fantastic way to sort of develop an ethos uh, for um, not just for composting, but for um, protecting and, and conserving uh, nature and natural resources. Next slide, please. 
Um, this this shows a, a a sign next to a sort of what a, a kind of a digging area that has sort of sculptural creatures of all this of all these uh, species underground at our at our Oregon Zoo, and um, you know this this is just an example of of a way that you can inspire kids to sort of dig and and make contact with with nature. Um, now. Decomposer critters are not the only ones that um, that we come in contact with through home composting. So next slide, please. Thinking strategically about you know how you roll out your program, I just want to make sure that you you keep in mind um, that uh, that rats are no fun. They're smart. They bite. They love compost. And um, and if you want to be wildly successful in your program. Um, and reach large, you know, swath of of your public. Um, you're you're going to have a lot of responsibility in in terms of preventing um, rodent issues from arising. So, with that in mind, um, I've always collaborated with with in San Francisco and Chicago, and here with sanitation departments in developing our program, um, and also made sure that we use an RF uh, an RF P, not an RFB, to um, to secure, to procure compost bins and specify rodent resistance. Um, and you know this this is really important. Um, and you can also specify other things, uh, sustainability of the company's policies and other things um, through an RFP process rather than an RFB process if your uh, local agency uh, allows that. You just have more flexibility that way. And um, and I would just say, don't be shy about warning people against rodents in your education and outreach. In, in San Francisco and in Chicago and here in Metro, um, we convey the, the guidance of our sanitation departments to compost food in rodent-resistant bins and to actively manage any open piles of yard trimmings. Next slide, please. Um, so you may be thinking, this is all so fun. It should be easy, right? Well, of course, it is a matter of perspective. And my experience is that things take time, especially good and effective things. And and um, it's easy to make a brochure, but it's much, much harder to change behavior. Um, and, you know, it does involve a lot of work. Um, Community-based social marketing is an approach that's really effective, and, and it takes a lot of commitment on the part of the agency and the people involved. Um, and I encourage you to check out toolsofchange.org for more information on that kind of science-based outreach approach. Um, and master composter and community composter programs are, are awesome ways to spread the word. And they're also really complex and time-consuming to develop to, to deliver. So just just be aware of that when you're when you're going into developing your programs, and you can have better greater success. Um, and it's true of demo gardens as well. Um, you know they uh, they they need to look really good um, to to really showcase what home composting is. Otherwise, people will be kind of turned off if the place doesn't look good. So you have to really keep them maintained really well, and and also be cognizant that there's uh, there's some conflicting goals that that like um, you know for example if if you want kids to be able to touch the worms, you're gonna have to replace the worms in your worm bin more often. That you know the the the, the health of the worms is you know, kind of counterindicated by all the um, all the touching of the of the um, educational particip education participants, but these are not insurmountable. It's just it's just good to sort of be cognizant of that uh, before you you know start things up and get get too involved in it. Uh, next slide, please. So um, partnerships are really um, an awesome way to be effective with fewer resources. Um, and at, at Metro here, um, we do partnership. We do partnerships on all different levels um, in our planning processes for a regional waste plan. In you know, in our delivery of our programming, all different ways. Um, in Chicago, uh, the the demonstration gardens that we set up were done in partnership and at the sites of different. Um, nonprofit organizations and and parks, um, uh, 
throughout the, the Chicago region, and we partnered very closely with the Extension Service to develop and deliver um, the master composter program there. Next slide, please. This one's just an example of one of the signs that we developed in, in collaboration with partners in Chicago. Um, next slide, please. So here's um, a really fancy compost bin and worm bin um, that was recently built at uh, the Oregon Zoo, which is a metro facility here. And, um, and we use this um, in collaboration with uh, OSU Extension Service Master Gardeners and zoo volunteers and metro educators. Um, to inspire families to welcome wildlife into their gardens, and part of that is decomposers and, and all the great life that composting can bring to a, a garden. Next slide. So um, by far the, the most exciting and the most deeply important initiatives uh, that you know agencies are engaged in and that Metro is really engaged in right now um, are those that advance diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we have a um, uh, we have a, a strategic plan to advance equity, diversity, and inclusion that that not that not only guides us and, and informs us and helps us to develop uh, programs and, and policies that engage, include, and hire and promote uh, people of color and other marginalized community members. Um, but also, um, it's it's happily really it's a requirement that all of our activities and programs and policies follow this this guidance. And um, it's it's great because meaningfully engaging communities of color in the process of developing our programs ensure that we better meet the needs of our diverse residents, and ensuring that our spaces don't just accommodate but welcome people with diverse abilities, languages, and backgrounds. Um, really expands our reach and helps us fulfill our responsibility to the public. Um, and importantly, as public entities, we can ensure that our procurement, contracts, and staffing are not biased, um, and that resources are used equitably, um, and that our staff uh, better reflects the diversity of our communities so we can better engage and teach and inspire um, people to engage in composting and other, other uh, behaviors and, and, and um, programs that we're that we're offering and promoting. So, <clears throat> excuse me. As as you develop and implement your programs to advance home composting, I hope you too can realize the great capacity um, of home composting to transform our urban environments into vibrant centers for equity, ecology, sustainability, and empowerment. And I just want to say, next slide, thank you so much for this opportunity to share these ideas with you. And feel free to contact me anytime. And um, I would love to connect with you and talk about um, all this stuff. I, I love compost. And I love home composting. And, and I really appreciate uh, everything that uh, you all are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Amazing. And, you know, your point about the marketing, I think, teases us up perfectly for our next presentation from Ian Jurgensen, who uh, manages the sustainability programs and policy development for Orlando's Green Works Initiative, including its backyard composting program, because one thing they have hit out of the park, I think, is the outreach and publicity. So, Ian, it's, it's all yours. Brenda, thank you very much for having me, and thanks everyone on the line uh, for tuning in and and uh, sticking around to to hear about it. Um, so I am uh, next slide. Um, I am Ian Jorgensen. The as Brenda said, I'm the sustainability project manager for the city. Um, we actually have seven different focus areas within our GreenWorks initiative, um, and I run policies and programs for half of them. So local food, livability, and solid waste. Uh, within solid waste, that includes the backyard composting program, also our commercial food waste program. Uh, we have a restaurant, um, hotel, hospital, etc. Uh, collection program where we go and uh, pick up in carts, um, and then also our com uh, community garden program, urban agriculture. Uh, urban wildlife, all, all great things like that. I wish I had included more of that stuff into this presentation um, uh, as my counterparts did. I, I, however, did not. But if you have any questions, um, you know, feel free to include them and I can uh, address them at the end. Uh, next slide. So just to get a little, a little bit of context, um, I, I focused a little bit more on kind of what composting is to Orlando and what 
the Orlando Metro and, and City of Orlando really like. Um, uh, folks from all over the world have a very uh, specific notion of what Orlando is, I think, because it's a such a huge tourism destination. So I just wanted to set a little context. We're in Orange County, Florida, uh, located in that orange box. Next slide. And within the county, that red area is actually our municipal jurisdiction. Um, so it's a smaller portion of the county, uh, but still a pretty decent sized chunk. Uh, next slide. Um, Orlando, we have 100, 100 plus lakes, over 100 parks, 21 community centers, and 277,000 residents. We're, we're up over 280,000 now. But the reason why I bring this up, um, next slide, is that for every one resident we have at any given time, there's 245 tourists in town. Um, I, I often ask, um, uh, in, you know, when I'm giving the context of Orlando conversation, what do people think? You know, for one resident, how many tourists? Um, it's hard to do that over a webinar, but uh, people often guess, you know, 10, 50, 25, things like that. It's actually a huge, huge number. And while that doesn't play necessarily into our home composting, backyard composting program, it does uh, directly affect our overall waste strategy because, uh, next slide, compared to our population, our, our tourism numbers are just enormous. So like I mentioned before, 277,000 residents, um, over 68 million visitors um, a year, that's uh, over 70 million now, um, 43 million pass through our airport. We're the third fastest growing um, uh, city in the country according to Forbes. Uh, and then I, I put the uh, poverty line statistic there just to indicate that even though we are a fast-growing economy um, in an enormously fast-growing state, um, we still have, uh, we still battle with um, poverty and, and um, inequality and, and many other of those um, issues. Next slide. So as I mentioned, Greenworks is Mayor Dyer's sustainability initiative. We try to balance um, sustainability, resilience, um, uh, economy, and equity in development of our, of our planning um, uh, and, and goals. Uh, we have two different planning documents. One is our municipal sustainability plan and one is our community action plan. Uh, one, you know, focuses inward, the next focuses outward. Uh, next slide. Uh, that's just the, the, um, the basic homepage of our plan, which shows our seven focus areas. Um, I already mentioned that, so we'll go ahead and skip ahead. And uh, we're focusing on, you can skip ahead one more. <laughs> Uh, okay, so let's get into the the uh, nitty gritty, so to say, of our of our program. Um, we started our program in 2015, and when we initially pitched this to to city um, leadership, the conversation was about cost avoidance for the city. So, um, in Orlando, we are. Uh, um, blessed and cursed with a very, very low tipping fee at the landfill. I say blessed because it's great for city operations. I say cursed because it makes waste diversion strategies extremely complicated. Um, we tip, uh, our tip fee is $33 and 60 cents. And I know I can, I can feel a lot of you on the, in the Northeast and the Pacific Northwest just going, Oh my God. Um, so uh, our cost avoidance was the pitch, uh, but it was also kind of complicated because of that. Uh, when we when we order at scale the earth machine composters, they cost about as much as uh, one ton to tip, about thirty three, thirty four dollars, um, when you're buying enough of them at a given time. So uh, what we determined was that in the course of four to five years of a family composting, they're going to pay for that unit themselves. Um, that does not include, and that's only a calculation based on food waste not including yard waste. So that calculation is very conservative because if you in include yard waste, that's of course gonna pay for itself a lot faster. Um, how the program works, we actually do free home delivery, fully assembled composters. So a resident can go, uh, go onto the link or call in, um, order a backyard composter, it's gonna be delivered to their front door in about two to three weeks, um, fully assembled. So I show a picture of the pallets as they come off the truck and one of our uh, workers there um, who's unloading them and then assembling them, stickering them and getting them ready for delivery. Uh, we have two cart drivers that deliver carts on a daily basis all throughout the city. And when we started this program, uh, we simply added a new type of thing for them to deliver. So the infrastructure for delivery was already there. We didn't have to start anything new. Um, these two, uh, two drivers were already in uh, various neighborhoods throughout the course of the week. So what we did is just, we just added a stack of composters to the back of the truck, um, and then uh, they were delivering that along with their normal route. 
we launched on uh, Valentine's Day um, with our Get Dirty campaign, and the uh, the joke was uh, Get Your Valentine Something Dirty for Valentine's Day. Um, initially, when we had these conversations about uh, the marketing campaign and, and what the videos were going to talk about and how we were going to address um, humor and content, um, it started as a bit of a complicated uh, pitch, but uh, over the course of, of putting together some example materials, it actually was very well received by internal city staff and then extremely well received by, by our residents. Um, since 2015, we have delivered over 6,000 uh, composters. Next. Um, just to give you an idea of what some of the graphics we put together for the initial launch were, um, uh, I didn't realize how deeply in love we were until we decided to make compost together. So um, really trying to play on the humor of Valentine's Day and uh, innuendo that's kind of baked in there. Um, we definitely pressed that pretty hard. Um, next slide. So there's another example of, of the types of marketing materials we're putting out there. Um, of course, these are just examples of many. Next slide. And then as spring press forward, we changed the marketing a little bit just to kind of fit with the season, but the, the feeling is the same. Next slide. When we launched, we did a work along with um, uh, Mayor and Commissioner uh, Patty Sheehan and um, uh, and delivered five composters to, to residents, um, installed them, and uh, Mayor Dyer and Commissioner Sheehan talked to the residents about Backyard composting, the uh, you know various news channels came along. Um, the picture on the bottom left, the gentleman in the yellow shirt, is one of our two drivers. I told him that it was a perfect picture, except he's staring right at the camera. But um, I like to include it anyway. Um, uh, next slide. So our promo video suite that we that we produced uh, was based around Get Dirty. The original Get Dirty video launched on Valentine's Day and had um, almost 1,600 views. Um, the next we put out was Get Dirty with Your Neighbors. So uh, now that you're getting dirty at home, spread the love next door. Um, and that had uh, over 2,400 views. And then the most recent video we put out was Get Dirty in Your Backyard. And that was an in innuendo based on the, the pizza delivery guy, um, which I'm sure you can uh, – put one and one together or go watch the video if you're curious how that one ends. But um, that one uh, we just launched at the end of last year and uh, had over 2,400 views. Next. So after we, um, uh, to kind of couple with the marketing videos and the marketing materials that we have ongoing, um, we put together some Get Dirty social media videos. And the idea for these videos is not only to to, to show kind of the stages of composting or what we consider, you know, preparation, maintenance, and harvesting compost, uh, but to keep it really short and really snappy. Um, generally speaking, uh, your audience's attention span is very, very short compared to what it might have been 20 years ago. So when you're putting together marketing materials, it has to be snappy. It has to be funny. Catch their attention. Give them the information they need and then, and then be done. Um, anything that lasts more than you know, half a minute to a minute, people skip skip over it. Um, so just be cognizant of that when you're putting together your materials. Also, um, really text-heavy documentation is, is oftentimes skimmed but not read. So um, figure out what's most important, deliver that message in the time that you have in a medium that, that will catch people's attention, um, and then invite them to learn more by doing something else. Um, so on those three videos, each one were 20 to 30 seconds. We have uh, over 6,000 combined views. That's actually my home composter, um, and that's me <laughs> doing that. Uh, I, my composter was ready, so I just told our communications team, let's go let's go harvest it, and then I have a, a big pile of leaves and a, a freezer full of fruit, food scraps that we can um, we can put together the preparation video. So check those out um, on our YouTube channel. Next. Uh, we partner with the University of Florida IFAS Extension to do our workshops. Uh, we've had 10 total. Um, we have two additional planned this year. Um, generally, we get about 20 attendees per, per workshop. Uh, the one, the next one that we have planned for uh, two weeks from now actually has already 55 people um, uh, registered, so we're excited about that. Uh, we don't do mandatory trainings. Um, I know a lot of communities do do that, um, and that's a, a certainly one way to do it. We don't make these mandatory, and have found that uh, people come out and and get their 
you know, enjoy the workshops when, when they want to. Um, we also do many, many, many neighborhood uh, trainings that are much more informal where myself or one of my colleagues will go to a neighborhood association's, you know, meeting and we'll go and present about the program, about backyard composting, um, how to compost, how to use compost, things like that. Um, we're not great. I'll be honest with you. We're not great at uh, recording impact of those. Um, I was really um, super impressed with, um, uh, with the gentleman from Austin's uh, metrics on that kind of stuff. Uh, we need to start being better at, uh, at getting that data together and, and keeping track of that. But uh, we do those regularly at least once a month. Um, and next slide. And that's it. I'll, uh, I'll take up the least amount of time and leave, uh, leave lots of time for question and answer. So there's my information if you're curious about how our program works or you want to hear more about um, our urban agriculture or chicken programs or things like that, we can, uh, we can chat. Great. Thank you, Ian and Ron and Carl. Um, uh, in your uh, question uh, window um, on the webinar control panel, please, we have a number of questions. Uh, so type any additional questions. And what we're going to do now, we just have a few polling questions, and then we're going to uh, open, then I will start having the Q&A for the next 15 minutes. So Nick, first polling, last series of, I think there's three, three or four polling questions. All right, so now, uh, how encouraged are you to support development of a home composting program? All right. Let's see, we can get up to 80%. We're halfway there. Thank you for participating. And we still have 88 folks on the line. Thank you. All right, let's. 60, two thirds have voted. Let's just show the results. I want to get to some questions just to get a sense. Okay, that's very promising. Nobody put not interested. Okay, next question. Um, and this one has to do with about making the compost bins available. Um, which did you method did you like? I know we didn't actually have a lot of time to go into the details, so there's the not sure button, but. Uh, vouchers, rebates, which allow freedom for people to choose the bin types, um, sub subsidizing the bins so residents can have them under market value, bulk purchasing, and other equipment, passing the savings on. Orlando was an example of providing bins for free or not sure. So, hmm. all right, two thirds have voted. Let's see the results. Um, Okay, all over the map, but it looks like vouchers, rebates. Interesting. All right, uh, I think we have um, two more really quick. Um, this one is about training. Uh, you just heard from Ian, his training is not mandatory required. A lot of programs do require training in, in order to get the discounted bin. Do you think some sort of training should be required to receive a free or discounted bin? All right, we have more than 70, almost 75%. Let's see the results. Yes, okay. Training should be required. All right, and the last question is really just about how you heard about the webinar. This really helps us. So um, if you could select um, our email outreach directly or social media, somebody else, guest outreach or other. Guest being one of the presenters, by the way, forward it to you. All right, uh, we're almost at 75% of you have voted. Let's just get a sense. Okay, the direct email. Good to know. Thank you so much for participating in the polling. So now we're going to move into uh, the uh, questions. And um, I know we have a number of questions um, that don't directly relate to home composting programs, such I know somebody asked, how does carbon exactly sequester carbon, uh, compost sequester carbon in soil? So we can answer some of those questions offline. I'm going to focus right now on uh, the home composting. So we had a question about, did did you mention bin resale of cheap or free bins in the report? Any strategies to counter this? And um, I'll just say that 
We do have a couple of examples, maybe four different examples mentioned directly in the report. Um, New York City sells repurposed metal trash cans and also uh, constructs worm bins. Uh, Napa offers classes where residents construct their own worm bins. Uh, we at ILSR also do that. Mesa, Arizona, even though they're not one of our featured programs, we did mention that they, because we thought it was really interesting, they repurpose worn out plastic trash uh, containers and convert them to compost bins and they offer it to residents for a five dollar delivery free and then i know i believe there's a number of communities that also offer free bins and montgomery county maryland uh, offers a geo bin uh, brand uh, rolls of basically recyclable plastic that you assemble into cylinders and that's their open system so so the county really just um, uh, encourages residents to use those for, for yard debris, not for food scraps, but those are free. So those are just some examples. I don't know, um, Ron, Carl, or Ian, if any of your programs, please unmute yourselves, if um, you do anything with bin resale of cheaper free bins in the report. So Ron, I'll just, do you have anything you want to add to that question? Um, basically, the answer for us is no. No. Okay. Carl? Anything from your end in Oregon Metro? Well, we also have uh, offered uh, education and training on on building um, uh, composting bins and worm bins, um, and and we did in Chicago and and in San Francisco as well. Um, and we encourage people to use uh, you know reclaimed uh, materials in the process and and direct them towards sustainable materials as well other other sustainable materials but as far as reselling used ones no uh not particularly yeah okay and ian i know you know one thing that's innovative about orlando is you the city owns those bins and i do know you ask if residents are moving for them to contact you is there anything you know about the reuse or repurposing of bins that you want to share um, we, so we don't have anything currently in place about the reuse or repurposing, but something that I am very interested in developing, um, hopefully in the next, uh, I don't know, six months or so, would be the beginnings of a worm bin program based around our old uh, single stream recycling bins. Uh, we used to do single, uh, or rather dual stream, uh, apologies. We used to have dual stream recycling and uh, a few years ago went to single stream. And what that left us with was op you know, open top dumpsters filled with red and blue bins for uh, mm -hmm. dual stream recycling. So I want to find a way to repurpose those for worm bins, but um, it's, a, it's one of those on the to-do list items Right. Well, I, I know that Rhonda Sherman, who's an internationally known worm composting expert, uh, is on the webinar and probably hearing your question, and she helped train me um, on worm composting. So we can maybe she might have something to add to that. Um, another question we have is about how, it, you know, the question actually came in as much of the funding for these programs comes from tip fees and is this model self-defeating? I ask you not only to address that question, but really the wider question of how how are you funding these programs? And maybe you can comment on the, the benefits, you know, to your local government of um, savings as well. So um, I'm going to go backwards uh, on this one. So Ian, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, from the from the self defeating standpoint, that question, I think I think it largely depends upon how your garbage infrastructure is set up. We we as a city are a municipal hauler. We do not own or operate landfills or uh, recycling MRFs. So when we can reduce our tip fees going to the landfill, that's just a straight savings for us. Um, I have been in touch with many counties in Florida that are interested in running programs, and that's something that they run up against. You know. Um, the, the way that we were able to justify funding the program was that if people use the containers, they pay for themselves. Um, whereas if you're a county or you're a, a city that runs a landfill, then it's a lot harder of a, um, it's a lot, it's much more difficult of a, of a, of a funding pitch than, than we had in that regard. Mm -hmm. Carl? Well, I think that, that it's always true in uh, waste reduction and recycling that, um, the or not always but depending as as Ian said uh depending on your rate structure um that that you should be able to put yourself out of business um and that's always been a motto of of partners um in the bay area and and chicago in 
it here in the Portland area. Um, but um, yeah, I, we have not necessarily been that successful, even though we're wild, you know we're wildly successful in terms of numbers. But but it has not it, it has not decreased um, the sort of the viability of the program um, uh, in terms of funding. And so yeah, I'm not sure exactly. Um, I think that that the important thing is just to to look at your rate structure and work within that and 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 find the opportunities to uh, show cost savings to someone um in in the process for supporting home composting and and Ron, do you have anything to uh to add on the funding for these programs? I'm sure uh so basically we uh, also don't have our own landfill um so we have to pay the tipping fees, um, just like um, Orlando. Uh, however, our program is funded by the clean community fee. That's why it's important to us that to make sure that um, those people who are coming into the program pay that clean community fee, and um, then we can go ahead and uh, that they, they, then they can participate in the program. Yeah. Um, so it is based on that clean community fee, which is eight dollars and ninety-five cents per resident. And All Brenda, right. this is Ian. Just to cl just to clarify one thing, we do only deliver composters to City of Orlando residents. So as a municipal garbage hauler for all residential service, um, anyone who is accepting or receiving one of these free composters is also a customer of the of the solid waste um, division, and we're picking up their garbage and they're paying us their collection fee. So just to clarify that that we observe a pretty strict jurisdictional boundary in that regard. Okay. Um, here's a question that's a, a good generic one for all of you. Um, what do you wish you had done differently? So again, we're going to go backwards. So Ron, we're going to start with you. Um, oh boy, that's a good one. Um, and you can pass, by the way. <laughs> I, I don't think, um, because I inherited the program. Um, so I came into the program um, just about two years ago. Um, so I don't know if the person who started this program, if they have anything that they would do differently. Um, I think right now um, we're kind of going through what we call an existential crisis. We're kind of like, um, why are we here? What are we doing? Um, and because we're kind of forced with this decision because we're also rolling out curbside composting. And so we're kind of, um, I have one half of the house um, basically killing my uh, population. Um, so uh, it's we're kind of going through, um, we're evolving. And so we're kind of like, what, what, what are we really doing? What, what is our main goal? Um, is it about education? Is it really the rebate that are getting people to compost? So we're asking some serious questions about the program and how it might evolve from here. Um, so uh, I know that's not the right answer for what we could have done different. I think it's just for us, it's about what is next. What are we yeah. going to do next? Yep, and one thing I'll just add to your answer, Ron, since we did this in-depth case study of Austin, is that one of the things I think that you, that the city stands apart from is some of the others is you have done a series of evaluations and you actually have changed the program. So it's led to like things like the community-led training or where the trainings are happening, um, you know, including vouchers and rebates. You started with just one, so. Um, Sure. Folks, really look at what Austin's done. Carl, is there anything that you wish you had done differently? Well, I, I would say the only thing is just if we would have started earlier in in our in our really in depth uh, um, uh, racial and, and equity and and inclusion and and um, and that 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 work, um, I think that uh, we'd be further along in addressing a lot of the deep issues that our nation faces. So, so I just you know I think that's probably the one area that I wish we would have started earlier on, um, you know, writ large. But that's good. That's pretty general. <laughs> Ian. Oh man, I've been racking my brain. Um, our our program is still really young, um, just a, a few years old. Um, when I came um, when I came on board, it was like 
right when we were about to launch. So there had been my, my predecessor was putting together the the planning and, and getting everything going and, and putting together kind of the nuts and bolts of the program. Uh, and then I came on board and just about a month later, we, we actually launched the thing. So, um, uh, so I can certainly understand the, the, you know, developmental, um, uh, part of that. The, oh boy, I, maybe I guess it would be most related to, uh, proactively, um, finding metrics that we could use to evaluate the program uh, in a more uh, metric-driven way. Um, a lot of what we have is um, anecdotal and um, kind of experience of people that we've talked to and um, kind of community knowledge in that way. Uh, but we don't have a lot of really good numbers aside from total bins distributed. Um, so maybe maybe that. And maybe uh, um, cho choices of residents. I like, I like that as a, as a an important tenet of, of the programs that, that you've been talking about, Brenda. Yeah, good. Um, we have a lot of other questions, but we're at time right now. So I will share the, all the questions that we received. Uh, some of the other questions I'll just share with you now, you know, have to do with marketing and outreach and social media. And if you've actually, Ian, in particular for you, have you evaluated the Earth Machine, you know, to see to what extent residents are satisfied? and other ideas about partnering with voter registration organizations uh, to get outreach out and questions about how much of the waste stream can be handled by backyard composting. So thank you all for your questions. Um, we will coordinate with the presenters to see if we can uh, address these questions and share them with all the participants. So at this point, I really want to thank my staff for your assistance and uh, all the presenters and all the communities we profiled and all of you for participating until the very end. And please stay in touch as you roll out your programs. We would love to hear about your program and track your success and feature it. So stay in touch and thank you all and have a great rest of your day.